So there you have another example. A completely different PowerPoint, a completely different photo story by a teacher who teaches a completely different subject. Um, any thoughts? Things good or bad that you saw? Yeah. Uh, being a music person, when she was speaking about the challenger, when she was speaking about tragedy, the music really reflected what she was speaking at, about. But when she changed it to a positive aspect, I don't know if you guys noticed, but there was a change in music, a change in mood, like you could be the inspiration, and so the music was inspirational as well. One thing I noticed about your, your podcast is um, it, we have such a wide range of voices in this class, but the podcast itself, the success of it did not depend on your voice. It was how you used your voice. Some of you had great voices, but you didn't apply them well. And some of you maybe were a little bit insecure in your voice, but you really let it go in your podcast, and the results were great. Um, so the first lady with the Benjamin Franklin, her voice... Um, not necessarily that she's a monotone person, but the way she presented her material was more monotone. And music um, creates such a, a mood. I, I'll give you an example. Um, you guys familiar with the, um, the horror movie Halloween, you know, from the 70s? When they first um, released that movie, they kind of did kind of a trial run to talk, test audiences. They did it without music, without any music in it. And people hated it. People walked out of the theater, people were, you know, bored, people didn't like it. And then John Carpenter added his mix into it, and it became one of the great, you know, horror films of all time. So music has that special way of, of uh, evoking uh, feelings and, and, and creating emotions, so that's a really good point. That's, that's one of the strengths of her uh, photo story, and some people might have not even realized it was happening, they just kind of felt something inside of them, and the music was helping to create that. Anything else? The images in both the pictures and the text weren't as static as the first one. It was very dynamic, like layered or um, tiered. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Anything else? Obviously, we have two, you know, two totally different photo stories with different rates of success. Um, the legacy photo story was created by a teacher who has some experience with photo story, and everything that she did in that photo story, I'm gonna. You know, do my best to show you how to do tonight, and hopefully you can take that with you and create something similar. No pressure. Why photo story? Here's some of the pros. Uh, photo story has a wizard that literally takes you through step by step, and that's why it's so easy to work with, even down to the elementary level, because it literally walks you through every stage in plain and simple terms. There's no geek speak. So even students at your younger ages, I've done photo stories with first and second graders without any difficulty. And you get pretty professional results with nice transitions, which, again, one of my big things is allowing students to take ownership of their products and kind of injecting some innovation into it. And so there's enough features in Photo Story that gives them some flexibility. And it's free, and we like that. We always want free stuff here, and free because if we're going to work on it in school and inspire kids, we want them to take it home with them. If it's not free, well, that just limits our audience as well. And digital products are very portable. We have the hand-in, hand-out system here in Newport News. You'll be, you'll be uploading these onto the wiki, so it's really easy to move back and forth. Cons, must be downloaded. Uh, have to have Windows Media Player 10 installed. It defaults to that. It will also work on VLC Player because what it does is it creates a uh, WMV video file, which is not a high definition standard, okay? It's one of the lower definitions. Um, because it's free, it's not going to be as full featured as say, you know, suites out there like Nero or um, um, Adobe uh, Premiere or, you know, Sony Vegas, you know, these, these programs that, that you can create these really full featured movies on. So it has its limitations. Um, and, and yes, it does take a bit more time than a pencil and paper activity, but because we're now moving to digital portfolios with students, this is something that they can put in there that they can then take with them. So let's just talk about what digital storytelling itself is. Using a story to present information by using computers, pictures, video, narration, and music to create and share stories. So it is exactly what it sounds like. It's storytelling in a digital way. 
And because we, that, that, that storytelling is so key because one of the employers out there will tell you that the main thing, that one of the main things they're looking for is the ability of, to oral, have oral and written communication strengths. And photo story requires students to be able to present their information, their research in a really concise way. So it's a great opportunity, particularly for English teachers, to really work on um, well-written, concise statements that tell a lot without using a lot of words. 250 words. I'll show you the example here in a minute. This is just a good recipe, kind of a good combination of, 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 of things to make a good photo story. About a dozen pictures. And this, these are guidelines, okay? More or less. I've worked with uh, students where the first time, and this PowerPoint, by the way, is already on the wiki. You can view it as many times as you want. Uh, I've worked with students where the first time we've done a photo story, we've literally we've only had five slides. About two minutes in length, give or take. Again, these are all kind of uh, ballpark figures you're looking for when you first start out. And there's a reason that the, these, these uh, are there, because... Uh, Anything more or less doesn't produce the best product the first time. Around. The more you get comfortable with photo story, you'll be you'll kind of break out of these bounds. But the first time around, these are good um, things to work with. Digital storytelling reinforces educational skills, reading, writing, and public speaking. Research, documentation, and organization. I'm going to show you how we get from point A to point B, point A being the beginning, point B being a finished photo story product. And there's a, a process that students work through. Um, and it's really a good example to them of, of how to organize content to create an end product. Cooperative learning and problem solving, and, and, and you guys are going, in this project, many of you are, have the option to engage in cooperative learning, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. 21st century technology skills. And that's a big one because one of the key buzzwords here in Newport News is differentiation. In other words, the ability to create a lesson that has built-in uh, built pieces that cater to students of different abilities. Whether it's different learning styles, whether you have your hands-on learner, your kinetic learner who needs to be up and about, whether it's students here or there in terms of learning, in terms of, of their ability to reproduce the results on tests. Technology inherently um, caters to learning styles because in many cases, especially when you're using technology, every student is starting at the same point and it doesn't always require prior knowledge so students are on the same, same page. And this is a big one because just like with the podcast, and many other things that we do, the first thing that students are going to want to do when they start a photo story is do all the fun stuff. They're going to want to work on their transitions. They're going to work on special effects. They're going to work on inserting music. And so that's why I'm going to give you tonight, and this will also be on the wiki, um, a tried and true, a tested, step-by-step -step process for your students so that they know piece by piece how to work through rather than kind of inverting the pyramid and going backwards. This is an example. And that is an example of, of how a lot of students think. They want to do the fun stuff right away. It's our job as educators to get them to focus on the content and have a strong foundation to work with. So what does it look like? Here's the process. First step is selecting a topic. Now, a lot of this will be driven by you as the teacher. Okay, if you're working within a particular unit, you may have topics, the same topic that we're given out to every student. Student, if you are working on famous Americans, you have a whole you know, range of different people that the students can work with, so they have some choice in the matter. Setting checkpoint two days, that helps students stay organized and on schedule. Step two is researching the content, which, you know, that's oftentimes the one that takes the longest, because students don't know how to research. I noticed in a, in, in a lot of your lesson plans, you said students will be taking notes. Well, amazingly enough, students don't know how to take notes. You tell students to take notes on what you're doing, they don't know how to do it. 
they either don't want to do it or they don't know how to do it. So they sit there with their notebooks, and unless they're some of the more higher order students, some of the more advanced students, many of the lower students aren't going to know how to take effective notes. They've never been taught. It's never been a direct learning experience for them. So don't assume that when you say take notes that they're going to know how to do it or even want to do it. All right, writing a script. And uh, this will be, um, I have detailed this in one of the attachments that I'll show you on the wiki. It's just a matter of, I, I just have, sometimes have kids draw squares, draw boxes. Each box represents a different slide. And on, in that box, they write down the script. Sometimes we have a research paper and we pare it down. And that's, that's it, uh, focus on the content, not the product. Because what you really want this to be is a learning experience for your students where they can hone their writing and um, producing skills. Collecting the images. We will talk in de in le at length about that because that, as you saw from the first photo story, is one of the things where most people mess up. And there's several ways of getting them. Google Images, a scanner, a digital camera. The quickest, obviously, if you find sites that are not blocked, is Google. Import and arrange the images. Again, the script drives the process. And you have complete flexibility to arrange them. Then we have narration, audio, and music. And this would include things like transitions and special effects. This is at the end. I always have them write, complete the entire photo story then go backwards and record their voice, add in music, special effects, etc. We talked, we talked last week about um, talking over top of the mic but not too close so you don't hear that popping when they get to P's and F's. Uh, that's why the headset mics are so good because they can arrange them that's, you know, four inches from their face. And the format. There are two options with your photo story. Just like Audacity, when you were using Audacity, you can save your project file, and you can go back and work on it. And then you finally, you, you create the MP3, which is your final version. Same thing with PhotoStory. You have a project file, which it's always going to want to keep. That's the thing that you can go back to over and over again and edit. Then you have the final video, which you'll give to me. So when you hand in your project, you won't be giving me your project file, you'll be giving me your final video. Watch a media player. You can insert the video clip in PowerPoint. You can burn it to CD, DVD, post it to a website. Okay? Now, I want to show you. We're going to walk our way through Photo Story 3 here in a minute. But I want to take a moment to talk about images. Because this is where students mess up and teachers mess up the most. Let's say I'm looking for an image of a dog. I'm doing a photo story all about dogs. <clears throat> I like this, this dog on steroids. And I want to insert that into my photo story. Well, Google now, since they've recently revamped their page, you can sort your pictures by large, medium. And so the best thing to do is to sort them by how big they are and go to the large ones. Now, sometimes your search is going to be narrow enough that, that filtering them like that will remove a lot of the pictures you want. No problem. We'll just click back to any size. If you click on a picture or just hold a uh, mouse over it, you'll see right here the resolution. This one is 600 by 530. All right? Those, that's, that, that's the resolution, the pixelation, how clear it is. What you saw... In the Benjamin Franklin video is a teacher that was using images that had a low resolution. So for example, let's see. Let's see if I can find a real small one. That's 480 by 480. Uh, 360 by 4, 361 by 400. That's fairly small. 312 by 312. I'm guessing she used a lot of pictures that were 100 by 100. 200 by 200. 300 by 100. Pictures like that. What you want, at minimum... The very minimum that you want is around 400 by 400. But the larger you can get, the better. Because 
when you insert the pictures into PhotoStory, PhotoStory will spread them out corner to corner. And if they're low resolution, they're going to look blurry because it's essentially you're taking a small picture and you're trying to stretch it into a large screen. And you've already seen the results of that in the first photo story. If you can, sort them into large. That's going to give you your best opportunity.